I'll be going to conferences or traveling around and people will come up to me and they're like, oh my God, it's Dr. Naidu. I saw you on this SSF video. So definitely check out the YouTubes. There, there are tons of great, great content. I watch the surgeons videos all the time to learn about what's new and up and coming. So definitely access, look at that, beautiful SSF TV. So now we're gonna sort of switch back to neurostimulation. I'm just gonna focus on spinal cord stimulation. You guys have already heard quite a bit about dorsal root kink and stimulation. Um, every year it gets shorter and shorter, so I only have 15 minutes, but um, as you guys already heard, I'm Ramo, I'm an anesthesiologist. I live in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, I'm in Marin County, which is the county right across the Golden Gate Bridge, so we're just located just five miles up the road on the 101. I work with a lot of different companies, as you can see here. Um, and some people might go, well, gee, this guy's super conflicted. Um, but the reason I do this is because I want to be at the leading edge of what's coming. I've always felt like if, if I was prescribing opioids and giving epidural steroid injections for the rest of my life, I said, please shoot me. Um, so I'm really glad we're seeing new innovation and progress in the fields. And that, that's what you're seeing today and this weekend is all the cool new stuff that's coming about. <clears throat> So I'm gonna give you a brief history of dorsal column or spinal cord stimulation, talk about something called the SAFE principles, go briefly into the evidence, talk about all the different vendors, who are all the people out there, give you some tips on guidelines you can refer to when it comes to how to do these procedures, talk about the multiple societies, and last but not least, tracking outcomes, with, which Dr. Schonard will talk about later. The birth of this field started with this paper, 1967. Dr. Norm Sheely, a neurosurgeon out of La Crosse, Wisconsin, did the first case of dorsal column stimulation by sewing, as you can see here, a bipolar electrode directly onto the spinal cord in a patient with metastatic breast cancer who was at end of life. This was for palliation. It was a proof of concept based on the gate control theory, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with. Mel and, uh, Wall and Melzack uh, developed that theory in 1965, the idea that if you stimulate these alpha A beta fibers, you can create this increase in inhibitory interneurons uh, in the spinal cord, and that can lead to pain relief. So that was the idea. Um, what isn't shows, shown here is the large external generator that was connected to this, this wire that was directly sutured on this patient. Because as you can imagine, the computing strength at that time is very different than what you have today, and the energy requirements are very different back then. The patient ended up dying four days later, uh, not related to the procedure, um, but in her four days, they described the pain relief she had with the use of spinal cord stimulation. And so from there, um, there was obviously development and innovation and improvements in technology. Uh, it was out of Japan where the first use of epidural electrodes came about. <coughs> Uh, obviously, putting these things directly on the spinal cord was fraught with risk uh, for a neurologic injury, injury or, or, or infection. Moved up from the bipolar electrode to the quattro electrode, the four electrode arrays. You can see how that increases over time. The first implantable pulse generator, the IPG, putting everything under the skin, was not until 1981. Commercialization happened thereafter. Um, really taking off of what we saw from the cardiac space, right, with pacemakers and AICDs. So if you think about really the development of, of antiarrhythmic devices in the 1960s, you can see a parallel history in cardiac rhythm management device to what we're seeing here with spinal cord stimulation. You can see sort of, I've, I put in different colors, um, the different groupings of what's been innovated upon. So like from the electrodes to the can, to the targets, to the waveforms, or paradigms of stimulation in the light blue. So that's what you're really seeing here as, we, as we've moved forward. How many of you have heard the SAFE principles? All right, so this is a good thing to think about for any new technology. Anything you're looking at today that we're showing you and you're wondering, should I, should I learn this? Should I be doing this? Remember SAFE, so number one, safety appropriateness. Is this the right thing for the, the condition I'm treating in this particular patient? How much does it cost? Is it good for our healthcare system? Is it good for our patients? Is it good for us? And how effective is it? So risks versus benefits, appropriateness, and then the economics. 
really think about those things with anything. You can apply this to any principle, frankly, in, in life, but also certainly for medical devices. Um, and certainly, hopefully, you're learning about how we approach each one of these topics for every device we're talking about. Here are the level one studies substantiating uh, the different therapies. Really, to me, the Senza RCT was, was a, a big deal in this world because it was the first real prospect of RCT with spinal cord stimulation, uh, published in anesthesiology, Leo Caparel, a uh, good friend. Uh, DRG stimulation, the accurate trial I mentioned, January 2017. Uh, you see the other targets here with uh, Burst DR in 2017 with Evoke, uh, the feedback loop from Saluda, uh, and then all the way down here with the diabetic peripheral painful neuropathy from Dr. Peterson. So these have been some of the great studies that have come out, DTM, Michael Fishman, uh, in the last eight years now. These are really the studies that are propelling what we're seeing right now currently. And when I gave this talk 10 years ago at the very first SSF Fellows course, there were three companies. The three you see on the left, now you can see how that's changed over time. In fact, there's been a company that came on and then went away, New Vectra. Um, each one of them has their own bells and whistles. I'm sure they've all come to you pitching what they have, but it's good for you to do your own grid. This is what I did when I was a fellow. I had a grid, I was like, what does each one do? What are the differences? What are the similarities? You should do this for yourself with every single company that comes out. I just keep on expanding on it every single year. Biotronic is the latest entrant into the space. They uh, earned their FDA approval in April uh, of this year. So uh, I was fortunate to be the first to implant uh, a full system in, in the world um, for Biotronic. Uh, Saluda brought the feedback loop, which is a really interesting concept, and every company is interested in that. Uh, and then the different waveforms, uh, which we can get into in more detail. For DRG, there's just one. You've already learned about it. Um, formerly StimWave, now Curonix, was FDA cleared for DRG simulation, but not FDA approved. Um, but they haven't really been talking about DRG simulation very much. They've gone through some issues. Guidelines, uh, the Neurostimulation Appropriateness Consensus Committee, or the NAC guidelines, they're published in neuromodulation roughly about every three to six years, depending on the cycle. Uh, really good to look at this. It goes through every, every topic, um, what to do with, with antithrombotics, what's the best infection avoidance uh, protocol. And they have the same thing for DRG stimulation. So definitely look those up. Uh, if you become a member of NANS or the North American Neuromodulation Society, you have automatic access to those guidelines. There are one million societies <laughs> out there not really, but there are a lot. And, and one of the challenges we have is that uh, historically, societies were based on our, 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 tra our mother training. So if you were an orthopedic surgeon, you had orthopedic societies. And if you were an anesthesiologist, you had your anesthesia societies. Well, the, the beauty and challenge of this space, interventional spine or interventional pain, is that we're multidisciplinary. I mean, Doug's a radiologist. I'm an anesthesiologist. Dr. David's a physiatrist. Neil's an orthopedic surgeon. That's your Nora's neurosurgery. So even though we have our parent societies or parent boards, cross-collaboration happens here. Uh, and that's what we've seen more and more. The Pacific Spine and Pain Society, which I was a founder of, uh, just recently finished as president, we developed the society based on collaboration. We want surgeons and pain physicians to get together and figure out you know, how we move forward. NANS is really about neuromodulation. Um, all of the other societies have their own angle. IASP, which started here in Issaquah in the early 1970s, John Bonica at University of Washington started that. That's a very research-heavy uh, pain society, which has led to a lot of important foundational work as far as taxonomy, et cetera, and our ICD-10 codes. American Society of Pain and Neuroscience, kind of one of the newer kids on the block, uh, has really expanded some of the innovative stuff we're doing across the country. And again, there are many more societies than this, but it's important to get involved. And as fellows, it's generally free. So get as many memberships as you can to expose yourself to what's out there. And come to our meetings. I put out PSPS because we, we do free meetings for fellows. So we have our neuromodulation and minimally invasive spine lab run by neurosurgeons 
orthopedic spine surgeons in, in pain. Doug will be there. Lots of people will be there. Uh, Salt Lake City, February 24th. We're having our annual meeting in Southern California in September. The Aspen meeting is always in Miami in July. Uh, a lot of fun. Nans is this year in Vegas, January 18th. And then in not too far north here uh, in Vancouver, we have the International Neuromodulation Society, which is truly an international uh, conference. I love this meeting. They talk about all the ways neuromodulation is used outside of pain. So for cardiovascular issues, for rheumatological conditions, for obviously functional neurosurgery condition. But that's where you, what you really learn, where you really learn about what's going on in Europe, Asia, Australia, New Zealand, et cetera. I highly encourage you to come. And then last but not least, I'll just quickly say measure your outcomes. I, I talk about this every year. Neil's going to go into more detail about it. But I always say if, if you're not measuring what you're doing, someone else will. Uh, this is really the, the future. Of, it's the present and the future of what we're doing. Um, you're starting to see Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services mandating that you have an ODI or some sort of metric in order to get paid for your epidural steroid injections. Even though that's really frustrating for a lot of people who had their money clawed back because they weren't doing that, it's important. I totally agree with the move. We've got to be doing it. We shouldn't just be willy-nilly doing things and not seeing how the outcomes are. So there are different ways of doing it. I'm not going to get into great detail. Um, but there's a balance in, in forcing your patients to do this versus really getting some value out of measuring this. And so, Neil, I'm sure we'll go into more detail about what works and what doesn't. But with that, I'll end it. Any questions at all in that super fast run through of spinal cord stimulation? Out of that big list, which ones do you actually yeah. use in your practice? Yeah, so for me, it's a Promise 29, an ODI, and that's it. Um, I don't do any of the other stuff unless, like, I'm doing a study. So I'm involved in, in a number of studies in my practice. Catastrophization is always the most interesting one I find um, in a lot of our studies because that's, that's not just related to that therapy. It's related to a lot of things that we intervene on in those particular patients. Yeah. Neil, do you want to comment? So the uh, surgical registries... Um, and the interventional registries that I've worked with, there's always a pain component. Uh, that's the appropriateness. Um, there's always a functional component. And uh, Promise 10, Promise 29 are um, uh, CAT capable. So they're, they're, they're a good choice rather than uh, uh, ODI. But, but uh, ODI uh, is uh, satisfactory. Uh, so usually uh, pain and uh, function are critical essentials. The others, particularly <clears throat> the uh, others that measure anxiety, depression, uh, sleep, what they're doing is they're telling you about inappropriateness. Uh, and so you have to choose, because you have a limited office staff, to count these things until they become digital. When they're digital, you don't have to choose. You can do as many as you wish. Uh, uh, but uh, initially, you'll choose two or three, just like Ramos said, he chooses, chooses two. Does the promise include a return to work? Most of them don't, but that's the one the payer wants. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, when uh, being mindful of that, because there are five really important uh, participants in healthcare, the five Ps, the physician, the patient, the, uh, uh, the product and device manufacturer, the pr uh, producer, the, the uh, manufacturer, uh, the person who employs uh, purchaser. If you can satisfy the metrics for each of those individuals, you will always get authorization for what you want. But that's a big undertaking. Any other questions? All right, we've got another break, and then we'll come back.